Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spyberry podcast is for you. Hello and welcome to episode 247 of the Spybury podcast. We've got into our Bentley TARDIS. It's 1962. We're all meeting up to talk about the latest Ian Fleming novel, The Spy Who Loved Me. Joining us today, David Craggers is back with us and uh, he's had lunch with Ian Fleming. So really curious to hear uh, about that uh, lunch when you're ready, David. Absolutely. Also, welcome to South London's finest, Mr. Ian Douglas, who uh, manages, hosts, and uh, is the general custodian over there at the Hildebrand Group, which is one of the best groups to talk all things James Bond. Welcome back, Ian. Thank you. Good to be back. And we're also joined by author Andy Onyx. Andy, welcome back to the James Bond Book Club. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. Great to be here again. Thank you. And last but not least, we want to bring in a, a new guest to Spybury, making her debut is Frida Toth. Frida is 007 in the Adirondacks on Twitter slash X, whatever it's called these days. Um, Frida is a huge fan of 007 and actually lives in the Glens Falls stroke Lake George area where much of the Spy Who Loved Me is set. So really interested to chat with you about that, Frida. So... Um, today's episode, show notes, you can find everything at spybree.com forward slash 247. If you're watching this on YouTube, etc., please drop us a like and a subscribe. That helps us spread the word. Right, next word over to you, David. You had lunch with the man himself. What's happening? Well, I did. I had lunch with him last week, actually. And uh, I must say, I've got lots to report. Uh, we had lunch at Scott's, and there's no guessing who had to pick up the bill. Independent of that, uh, I have to say, uh, the old boy is still not looking great. He's a bit grey around the gill. But independent of that, he is massively uh, busy. And I detected a little bit under pressure as well. It was a bit of a strange, uh, a strange outing, to be honest. I mean, first off, on the good news front, after sort of years of trying, uh, Bond is now coming to the silver screen. And Ian is massively proud of this. Uh, you remember last time we met, I reported back that he actually did a deal with this Saltzman character. Uh, he did a quick deal in order to get his rights from underneath any potential raid from McElroy, who he was having a lot of difficulties with. Well, Saltzman couldn't get uh, the funding for the movies, but he teamed up with Broccoli, this guy, uh, Cubby Broccoli, who has the money. Uh, they've gone into production, and uh, it's up and running. And much to my surprise, the one that they're actually filming is Dr. No. So I was massively curious about this, and I asked Ian, you know, who they got to play Bob. Um, he said, well, he said, initially, so I was very worried because he wanted Richard Todd and some other character, but it's basically down to the producers and the producers were looking at different people. They often carry Grant the job. He said he'd do one, but he wouldn't do a series of Bond movies. So that was that. And then eventually they go with this relatively unknown, this this chap from Edinburgh, this uh, Sean Connery fellow. Well, Ian wasn't less pleased about this because he, he thinks he looks a little bit like a navvy. And he, look, he's got a tattoo as well, which, I mean, is a complete enigma to, to Ian. But anyway, he manages to come to terms with all of that because he actually went on the set uh, earlier this year, they started filming actually back uh, in uh, in January. Ian was over in Jamaica. He met the guy on the set, and he was much reassured. Uh, he also met the uh, the director of uh, of the movie, this guy Terence Young, uh, and he was very reassured by him. And evidently, Young is very much cut from the same git jib as uh, Fleming. And um, he's taken Connery in hand. He's talked to him how to walk, talk, wear suits and all things like that. So Ian's much more reassured. 
Uh, he also met the, the female lead that's playing Honey. And in true Ian fashion, he was like a fly around Honey. Um, and so he's, uh, he's more reassured. But they started with Dr. No because Casino Royale still belongs to the TV company from last time. And of course, Thunderball, which was to be the project, is still the subject of this court case, uh, part one of which was last year. But the problems with, uh, with McElroy still persist, and it looks like they'll be back in court again at the end of this year. So that's sort of much pressure on the old ball. Uh, independent of that, when it came to the book in his latest and greatest, I thanked him for sending us all our advanced reader copy. Did you really say latest and greatest? Well, we'll come to that. Uh, he, he, I, I, I thanked him for, for sending us his advanced reader copies. And he said he wanted them back. I said, well, what, what do you mean you don't want them back? He said, well, he said, the thing is really an experiment that's gone awry. He said, uh, I, I, uh, he said, I think uh, it, this is an experiment too far. He said, I've, I've asked Kate not to do a second printing of the book. He's forbidden paperback release. And he said, if it's ever made into a movie, they can only use the title and not the story. Well, I hadn't read it at that juncture. So I said, my God, I said, what are you talking about here? Anyway, he then goes on to say that he'd written it uh, because he understood that the books that he'd principally written for adults were being read by children at school. Uh, this is not what they were for, so he wanted to write a cautionary tale. I mean, what a load of balder dance. I've never heard <laughs> one come in all my life. I said, Ian, you're out of your head. I mean, I know full well that you'd, for, for a few, for a few, dollars more you'd stand at the school gates selling them yourself so what has gone wrong here? so anyway we left it at that i said and he actually asked if you could cancel your radio show show i said no i said the wireless show must go out here yeah and it's done it's done you very good in the past you know so we're going ahead with it so anyway we left it at that I've read the book, we've all read the book, so let's discuss the book. Who wants to go first? Don't mind. Go on, Douglas, kick us off. Um, I was surprised when I read it. I'd, I'd been warned that it wasn't a traditional Bond book, um, so I was kind of prepared for that, but it did still surprise me. Um, the fact that James Bond appears very late in the book, and he's almost like a minor character, it basically saves the day. And there's this long build up to this one, one night of adventure and madness, murder, devastation. Um, but I actually enjoyed it. And I've read it a couple of times now. After the initial shock of the first read, I decided to read it again. And I got a lot more out of it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the way uh, Viv's life was described, her upbringing. She had a tough upbringing. Her parents died in a car, a, an airplane crash. When she was young, she was taken in by her aunt. Um, the whole kind of religious snobbery of Canadian society, being sent to England to get finishing school, etc. And I enjoyed her story. And I enjoyed, you know, the education, uh, her life as a journalist, her love life, which was interesting. And although you could see where her love life was going, and it wasn't, it wasn't going in a good direction, it was still quite fascinating to read. And in some ways, I enjoyed the build-up to that one big night in Lake George than the actual night itself. Because the night itself, it was, it was, you know, it was full of suspense. It had action, violence. At the end, there was love and sex and all kinds of stuff. Um, but I enjoyed the build-up more than the actual climax, if you like. And I just thought, as a one-off, I thought it really worked. But I wouldn't want him to do it again. I think, go back to the formula. Uh, I mean, in general, I think it was a good book but not a good Bond book. It was interesting. Mm. It was different. Um, as a one-off, I enjoyed it, though. How about you, Andy? You want it from the hit? Shame. Absolutely. As always. All right, then. All right, then. Okay. 
it's in three sections, isn't it? Yeah. And two out of the three I thought were great. Yeah. And at this point, I probably put, better put my gum shield in because you might not like my actual choices. Yeah. So just, I just want to say the last book, Thunderball, I mean, that had more, that had more testosterone in it than a bricklayer's armpit, didn't it? Uh, and, and for, for Ian to have put himself in the position in this, this first person narrative of Viv, I think not only was it brave, but I think that the, the two parts, the first two parts, me and them were, were brilliantly executed. And there is some absolutely off the scale writing in those first two parts. The description of the storm, the development of Viv's character. Not a great judge in, in men, I'm afraid, Viv, yeah. She wound up with her aide Derek, didn't she? And then wound up with, she may as well have been going out with Rudolf Hess with the next boyfriend, you know? And um, so that was that. And, and I also thought that this, it began really almost like a modernist, what they're calling a modernist kind of novel, a bit of a, maybe a nod to Colin McGuinness there with, with, with Viv going and getting her, her scooter and, and all, all that kind of stuff, yeah? No black people in this book, strangely enough, which is rare for Ian, mentioning Colin McGuinness there. Yeah, so the first two parts I really enjoyed, although some of it was hard, hard reading, if, if you like, because Viv's experiences with, uh, with the fellas wasn't particularly nice. And good of Ian to be able to shine a light on that side of things as a man. The third part for me, the part where I hoped that that Aston Martin was going to go into the top gear. I just thought that the, it, it, it went, it went off a cliff bizarrely. Not immediately when Bond appeared, I was, there he is, here he is stood in the doorway. But what ensued for me, as, as we've come across with a few of Ian's recent books is it was almost like a, a, another author had completed it for me. Um, that's just my opinion in contrast to Mr. Douglas's opinion. Um, it almost seemed like this Bond, I was almost waiting for Bond himself to be an imposter, you know, or an imposter in place of Bond and waiting for the real Bond to turn up, you know. And we'll probably get a bit further into the villains and so forth further on, but you've asked from the hip, Shane, and I've given you it from the hip. That's, that's, that's my thumbnail summary of this book. Frida, yeah. welcome to Spybury. Why, why do you think Fleming's chosen to go down this route of writing from the female perspective? You know, it's book 10. He's got this series set up. There was these rumors about TV. You know, he, he's, he's enjoying a lot of acclaim when then he takes this right turn, um, or maybe even a left turn. Why do you think he's done that? Well, I, I've read a lot of uh, articles and interviews about Ian Fleming, and he very frequently said he was out of puff and out of ideas, and he wanted to do something different. He also, in my experience, writes women really well. And I know that that's something that's going to be strange to hear. But I think he said to himself, I'm going to do something different. He went in a, a direction that he had tentatively done before. He had tentatively tried Bond not showing up for a long time. He had done that in For Marshall With Love. He had tentatively done, in all, most of his books, he has women doing a monologue where they know way more than Bond will ever know. He did that very, from the first, he did that in Casino Royal. He did it very well in Dr. No when, um, when um, Solitaire was talking to herself about the voodoo. So he had had limited success with this. So he probably said, I'm going to just, I'm just going to go and I'm going to do something fresh. I'm going to do something different. And everybody's going to love it because they loved it last time I did it little. Now we'll do it big. So I think he purposely took a change that he expected everybody to love. And I read some of the reviews. Women 
reviewers tended to love it. It was called by one woman reviewer, I think this was for the Times, you know, muscularly brilliant and not for prudes. And another person said, you know, this is uh, a, a, Ian Fleming's best Bond girl to date. So I think a lot of people responded well. But from reading Ian's books, you could always tell there's this very fragile little boy writing the books, this guy looking for approval. And I think he didn't get the universal approval that he thought he was going to get. And that probably, that probably startled him. But I think he took a new direction because he wanted to write well and wanted to write fresh. And I think he did do that well. David, what do you think? I think it's another example of Ian's diversity as a writer, actually. We discussed very much, particularly when we talked about For Your Eyes Only, that he was experimenting with, uh, with different style, with, uh, style uh, and different types of, uh, of writing and different types of novella. And I think that he is using Bond as a vehicle uh, to experiment in a certain way because uh, he always has an eye for money in and he has an eye for sale. So I don't think he wants to separate with Bond and Bond is very, very popular. But I think he's using Bond as a vehicle to experiment as an artist and to diversify in the way that he's writing. And I think that to write in the first person narrative as a woman, to write as Vivian Mitchell, I think is a major achievement. And I think that he does her internal monologue extremely well. I have to agree with you, and I'm a woman, and I I absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm older than Viv now, but I remember being in my early 20s and having the incredible highs and lows that Viv has, and everything's ever, all the emotions are big, and everything's important. And I think he does that absolutely brilliantly, just so well. And he, he shows a lot of empathy uh, throughout. And I think his description of her adventures in London, uh, the five years that she spent in London and the two bad affairs and bad experiences that she had there were cautionary tales, if you like, and it was his way of building up uh, to having a damsel in real distress, but a damsel that you knew very, very well before the action started, if you like. And um, I think there were some great moments in it. I mean, one moment that resonated with me a lot was when she went to Hammersmith to pick the Vespa scooter that she was going to use here on her journey for, in Canada to, to America. And it was, it was really well done, and he really caught the moment of a modernist, really, uh, picking out this Vespa and picking out her outfit that she was going to use to ride it. The fact that the Vespa salesman was taking her out uh, for a test drive. She picked the the more sporty model than the other model. It was all extremely well done. And uh, the Sterling Moss helmet wasn't yes, it or something? And, that she, yeah, I mean, you know. and I was really, I really enjoyed that. And I thought that he built the me aspect of it extremely well. Now, obviously, as we all know, she returns to Canada and she starts out on her road trip through America. And she she stops off uh, at uh, uh, Lake George to uh, to the motel uh, to do the, uh, the the caretaker job for one night or whatever. And is set up basically by the owners uh, for insurance fraud that is to take place. And at that point, uh, we get to them. And I think at that moment, it changes gears, and not necessarily in a bad way, but it becomes very much like a Mickey Spillane thriller. 
And, well, and, it's funny yeah, you say that, yeah. David. And Fleming, it's funny you say that. Yeah, Fleming's experimented with this before. You know, there were touches of it in Live and Let Die, and there were touches of it Diamond. in Diamonds Are Forever. But he goes full bore Mickey Spillane. With me. Well, the reason I say that that's funny, David, is I was I, I was looking at the wires for some early reviews on this, and uh, John Fletcher at the Times actually writes as if Mickey Spillane had tried to gate crash his way into the Romantic Novelists Association. Yeah. Um, other uh, journalists, uh, the Daily Telegraph wrote, "Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear," <laughs> and to think of the books Mr. Fleming once wrote. And uh, I'll leave you with the Glasgow Herald, which wrote, his ability to invent a plot has deserted him almost entirely, and he's had to substitute for a fast-moving story the sorry misadventures of an upper-class tramp told in dreary detail. So the press ain't happy with this either. Well, no, not necessarily, because, I, you know, the ones I gave you were, were the press. For some reason, they don't get as much, um, I don't know, as much legs now. But there were reviews that were not only neutral but actually very positive and I, I just think it's 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 more fun to trash it than to to talk about the good press especially because the good press came from women and for me reading this book reading it of course in Lake George and I had picked it up because I had wanted to read a James Bond book and I grew up in in the Adirondacks so of course usually when I pick up a James Bond book it's because I want to go to Istanbul when I got to the page that said I was in the Adirondacks, I was in the Adirondacks at the time when I was reading the book. And I was so startled, I closed the book and I opened it up again because I just couldn't believe that it was in the Adirondacks. And it was done in such a... All the writing about the Adirondacks was so beautiful and accurate, much more accurate than my own diaries are right now because I'm, I'm not going to write about how beautiful the maple trees are. I'm surrounded by them. You know, I... When I read The Spy Who Loved Man, when I, when I reread it, you know, years from now, I'm going to think about the, the woman's adventure. She has a fantastic time, and then she's not crying over Bond. She's like, bye, I'm up on my Vespa. You know, maybe the money will come to her, maybe it won't, but it's not something she worries about. So I, I read it as a, a woman's adventure story, and I'm, you know, I'm not disappointed by that. I'm curious, why did he set this in the Adirondacks? What, oh, I don't know his motivation, but I, I would I would certainly think that it was... Well, yeah, he has, you know, an, an, Ivor Bryce lived in Vermont, right? Ivor she Bryce lived, lived in Vermont, across yes. the way. So he visited this area, as I understand it, because even the motel, he'd driven past something that looked they, similar they, to they, that they motel did. in Lake George. Yeah. I think he had a friend, actually, up there. Well, he had... Ivor Bryce, soon. Hmm? Well, Ivor Bryce lived about uh, an hour away. So yeah. and that's, and in, 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 or shall I say lives about an hour away. Um, although, did he break up with Joe? I can't remember. Um, but just return. But he also had a, yeah. Yeah, just returning to the story for a sec. You know, I thought yeah. when it did go very spillane when the villain entered in part two. But in, I think the weakness to me, and Andy actually alluded to it, is when Bond comes in. And I think that if you look at the dialogue, both the internal dialogue when Ian is writing as Viv, and the dialogue when Viv is speaking both to the gangsters and to Bond, it's superb. But when I look at the dialogue from Bond, it really very, very stiff and very, very, well, it lost its believability in a certain way. And there are a number of sort of stupid actions that take place in, in the yeah, he... Bali. And I thought that that was not, not realistic and not consistent with Bond's status as 007, an agent licensed to kill. It was more 007, an agent licensed to blunder, you know? And, and he did blunder. Yeah. 
Yeah. Dead wanderer. And I, he's the weakest well, person in the book, isn't he? Yeah. The weakest character. Yeah. And I he, no, he's the weakest character in the book. And of course, again, that's something I really love is that he, I love that Bond is more of a person and less than a cardboard ca character in this book because he makes human mistakes. He makes mistakes when he's tired. He makes dumb mistakes. We all make dumb mistakes, but we like to write our own stories so that we are the heroes of our stories. So in this case, this isn't something where a fan of Bond is saying it. It's this 23-year-old girl seeing this fairly ordinary guy who's got an extraordinary job. He makes mistakes. You read a lot of the earlier Bond books, he makes some very stupid mistakes, especially like in, you know, trusting people he shouldn't trust or blowing his cover or constantly asking for scrambled eggs like nobody will figure out who this guy is. Um, but that's what I love about this book is that mistakes that he has made in other books or similar mistakes are shown to be mistakes here. I love the idea of Bond as a human being. And yeah, it's more realistic, you know, isn't it? It's, for me, it's much more realistic. Because he makes dumb mistakes, and he even shows remorse over his mistakes. Oh my gosh, I should have shot them when I, when I had the chance to shoot them. I'm so sorry, Viv. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And you know, that's that's a really cool thing that the secret agent is a human being in this book. Yeah, I, I love that. Thing. And we we go back to the the damsel in distress thing. Um, I I I'm not sure damsel in distress is quite the phrase I would use because there are so many points where as you know because i'm a woman i spend a lot of time as every woman does uh um, trying to make a decision is this guy going to hurt me is this guy going to kill me uh when i get can i am i can i afford to get closer to the sky or do i have to leave right now that's something i have to do most days of my life that's just the way it is so sometimes you you give up before you even begin viv does stuff like okay i'm in front of the knife drawer when they get closer i'm gonna throw all the knives that's something that's not damsel in distress. She's being really resourceful. And if it doesn't work out for her entirely, at least she's not going, oh, no, what's going to happen? Maybe somebody will save me. You know, she's not doing that. And that is thrilling to read. That's thrilling to almost experience because he does it so well. Because he yeah. does the timing oh, of yeah. it. So. And also she's been toughened up by her experiences. You know, the what? death of her parents, the snobbery of canadian society having to go yeah. to england she's an outsider two very unlucky relationships with men you know her job what she's gone through in her career that's all toughened her up to make her the tough woman she is now and a very strong character it makes her a strong character and it's also you know when you're talking about bond not showing up until later in the book like when i was reading this waiting for bond to show up i kept going oh he can't show up yet because we don't know who she is yet and all the nasty stuff she went through made her the resilient character that she was so that she was able to hold her own until she had an ally. Not somebody to save her, but until she had somebody who was an ally. And she needed and we needed to see what made her who she is. Well, I the thing is I, true, I don't, you know, I don't doubt the strength of, uh, of Vivian's character. But at the end of the day, the structure of it was very much Bond is going to save the day. Bond is going to save Vivian, which is fine. But I felt that it was very much, in a way, that last section as well, uh, in very, very much like Key Largo, actually. Yes. Very Bogart movie. Yeah. And if I take... If I definitely got a, a I, Bogart feel. Uh, if I take a, an analysis with that, the Bogart movie, Key Largo, is much better done because you have a real sense of doom, a real sense of pending disaster uh, throughout that movie. And the claustrophobia, which is in the hotel in Key Largo, is missing in, in the motel in the spite who loved me you know it's it's not as, as well done it's just uh i i don't know why it's like that but it's just in my opinion that's where it is much less strong um you know the and, point the point david where um he's coming the 
gangsters have tried to get rid of him. He knows there's something wrong. He said, I'm going to stay. Then they go and sit further away and they're grumbling. And he's having this dialogue with Viv, because obviously this is from Viv's first exactly. point, person point, isn't it? Exactly. Now, what, what, what got me about it was that he has his coffee. And then he starts yeah. jabbering like a goose about all his previous operations that is with the British Secret Service that is, the, is involved in this plot. To, so for me, Viv must have been thinking, I'm in a really bad situation. I thought this guy was going to save me. And now it turns out he's from the bloody lunatic asylum down the road. He, yeah, he's going to tell, he's going to tell me he's, he's going to tell me he's Napoleon next. I mean, you can never have a spy called Napoleon, could you? But he's going to... You know what I mean? Well, that's, <laughs> that's the audience, though, isn't you, it? You, I mean, you make, you, make a, you make a good point, Andy. And that, to me, was one of the most uh, ridiculous parts of that section. To have... To mm. imagine the two thugs allow the the captive to have an open dialogue at a breakfast bar when they sit in another part of the room discussing whatever they're discussing. I mean, it's for the yeah. book. They just wouldn't have allowed that to happen. You know, but, but, Viv, but Viv is, she, she's fantastic, but she is as fl flawed in the sense that, as I said before, she, she is a bit naive in, in terms of, a track record, let's say. She's still very young, as you'd expect. And I think the whole thing about the that weird subplot where he's talking about the, uh, you know, the uh, the Berlin situation where they've got a a dissident who's gone over to the Toronto, I think, and they've got a hitman that's hired by Spectre to hunt him down. I think that was just a way of Fleming just to sort of shoehorn in some espionage. That's all it was. It yes. was yes, the it reader. Was, yeah. it, it made no sense. Well, it made yeah. no logical sense given the situation, but it added a little bit of subplot there, which I found quite enjoyable. But yeah, you're right. It's totally unrealistic for the situation. And, and I think, Ian, I would argue that he's dropped that in just to show us this is actually a James Bond Bond novel. So yeah. James yeah. Bond could be John Smith, yeah. kidney. Yeah. And but to tie into Thunderball and, and everything else. So yeah, that makes sense. He, I think he partially put it in to make it a James Bond novel. Yes. But again and again and again this, in this book, they try to have James Bond have his feet of clay. And there are a couple parts where Jeff says, oh, my gosh, he's just like, you know, every other thug I've ever met. And then, of course, at the end, the police uh, uh, captain, Captain Stoner at the end, um, says, oh, you know, whether you're on this side of the gun or you're this side of the law or that side of the law, they're all the same. So I think part of it was, um, yes, to remind us, you know, this is a James Bond novel. Although it's ridiculous, you know, can you imagine this, you know, 23-year-old woman going, oh, yeah, I read up on all the international spy stuff, sure. <laughs> you know, on the other hand, every guy I've ever been with, when I'm finally alone with the guy, he is going to have a monologue all about his job. So I'm <laughs> telling you. That that is really, really realistic, and that just happens to be his job. And well, he always says he's a type of policeman, doesn't he? He, he said several yeah. times in the previous novels, yeah. a type of yeah. policeman. And, at the, and one part I loved is that the policeman at the end, you know, who, Captain Stoner, who says, you know, everybody's the same. And this is such a 23-year-old, male or female, 23-year-old thing to do is to go, La, 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 why won't this guy just shut up, this old guy? And, of course, the guy's only yeah. in his 40s, and she's saying, why won't this old guy just, like, stop talking to oh, me? Yeah. Which is, again, a wonderful, realistic part of internal dialogue. I love that touch. Yeah, she just wants to get away, doesn't she? She wants to carry on with the yeah. travel and just have yeah. a happy life. Understand. Yeah. I think, actually, yeah. that it, it would have worked much better as a novella. Than exactly. Than Should have been in for your eyes only. Yeah. You know, there's a, there, there are redeeming features in it, and it's mainly about uh, uh, about Vivian and uh, and her story. Uh, very much, actually, that's the strength um, of it. Yeah, that's the strength of that's it. That's the you know? strength of it. Uh, uh, and and in certain ways, you know, the writing style sort of reminded me a, a bit of the Quantum of Solace. You know, was which is my absolute favorite. Yeah, yeah. I, I really love that one. I, I like it. I wonder 
if collectively people who love James Bond are more willing to forgive a change of style if it isn't a short story or novella, you know, because if we were eyes only, he's all over the place in terms of style. And we're like, okay, good. Try something different. Then when you come back, I want a charismatic villain and an exotic locale, okay? Yeah, stick to the format. That's what people want, isn't it? Well, but it's nice to... I, 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 as, it's be, as it's become much more very successful, there is going to be an expectation, and there is already expectations for his work. And um, I think it's going to have a difficult landing, this one. You know, um, I... Uh, do we think he's run out of steam, David? I do you think he's just, you know, it's book well, number 10. He's got the movie. Well, no. It's book number 10. Well, he, it's book number 10. He's already. He's got the movie. Don't... Hang on a second. He's book number 10. Yeah. He's got the movies out, right? So he knows, as you said, he's he's keen for a, for a quid. He knows they're coming out. Has he just run out of ideas? He's like, I'm, or is he just bored with the normal formula? Because as you just mentioned, Free, there about villains, these two are just a couple of hoods, right? We normally spend a long part of these conversations talking about the villain uh who's yeah. only larger than life but not in this case yeah. but, the, but these David, guys there's no had... comedy there's no comedy with the, with with the gang this is about is it his third or fourth go now david with gangsters in this series yeah. that he's, yeah, he's right. fought gangsters yeah and right. uh, before the you know they've been they've been either comedic or they've been homosexual they've they've, they've but these yeah, guys are seriously the nasty yeah. Yeah. Sorry, mm. mate. They're, they've had more of a backstory in the past, haven't they? Yeah. yeah, and these guys are really nasty, aren't they? They're they're really? pretty frightening, you know. Oh, particularly I have to say, I'm disappointed in the villains because they're usually uh, well dressed and they know food, you know. So, oh, we're going back. I don't, I'm not going to say I want to root for the villains, but they're usually kind of classier. Yeah, yeah true. Going, David. going back to Shane's point, actually, don't forget, Shane, he's already written the next one. He has yeah, well, yes, and I mean because he wrote uh, he wrote this uh, last year, and he's been writing right. the new one, and he reassures me that the new one is the spy story to end all spy stories. So well, he good. hasn't got fed up with it, and he hasn't given up. Good, and I I just think that it's an experiment, and to use his own expression, he he, he thinks it's an experiment that's gone awry. Now, whether or not it'll be judged differently over time is an open question. But I think that as we sit here uh, in 62, you know, um, it's not what the audience of 1962 are anticipating from Ian Slemmer. You know, uh, not what I wanted, to be honest. I, I thought it no. was, I thought it was poor. I thought it was poor. It was such a jolt that it was so out of character. I actually can honestly say, if I if we weren't meeting up here in Blaze to talk about this, I probably would have given up fifty pages in. I would have given up. Yeah. Because I wouldn't have read any more. I'd be though. like, "This is." I'm sorry, Ian. What did you think of the travel writing, though, Shane? Because you you know Vermont. What did you think of that? Yeah, I know that part of the world. It's great. I know Vermont is not the it's also, it's also. It's also um, it's very well written. If I want a travel log, great, but you know, that's not what I come to, to James Bond for. Not, you know, it's the way it describes the pines and the motels and everything. Great. But I just wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it that far. If it wasn't for this meeting, I'd have got 30, 40, 50 really? pages in and said, as first of all, I have to say, I thought someone had slipped me the wrong book. I thought they'd put the wrong <laughs> cover on it. I thought, Where, where's Bond? Where's M? Where's Ponsonby? <laughs> you know, where's the villain? <laughs> Like what's going on? Someone's, someone's having. I had to check the the diary. You know, is it April one? Is somebody having a laugh? So uh, I wonder. I don't though, think I would read this ever again. I have to be honest. The thing is, I wonder how, if there's an extent to which she was writing for Americans. You know, anticipation of say the movie audience bringing in more Americans because all my friends love it, and we love to go around and go. You know, oh, this is from the book, and this is from the book, and you know. Yeah, and he did it so, so well and, and showed such a good understanding of local history. I mean, le linking General Montcalm, from, so, uh, the skull of Montcalm was in her childhood um, school to where she was, which was Fort William Henry, which was where Montcalm had a famous victory. I mean, that was a beautiful looping 
And if you're around here, you see that loop and you go, wow, he was able to link these two, you would think disparate things. Here we are in Lake George where Montcalm had one of his famous battles and she is from the convent, had the skull of Montcalm. That was pretty cool. So my friends around here absolutely love it. And I wonder if there's an extent to what she was trying for an American audience. You know, I don't know that, but yeah, we go around here. Very... It wouldn't mean the same thing to the British audience, would it? That's because it, it meant nothing no, it to me. Wouldn't. Fascinating to hear that. No, you you wouldn't you wouldn't have any reason to know that. No. I mean I'm I'm right now walking distance from the waterfall in James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans. I'm Lovely. I could be there in five minutes. And that's mentioned in the book. And Storytown USA is accurately described in the book and all these beautiful things so that, you know, my friends around here are absolutely, you know, feeling seen, I guess. Or but maybe that's people, something where people of Kent um, are still dining on on Moonraker, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I enjoyed the Chelsea and London scenes. That's that's yeah, more. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think that it might as well. It might uh, it might be more popular with women as a, as a book actually. Yeah, possibly. Uh, uh, which, um, always. Which is. Uh, no, uh, no bad thing in terms of expanding his audience. Uh, there's already a lot of women reading the books anyway, uh, and this, you know, this might uh, might store with them. But um, as you as you say, Shane, it in the round, it's uh, it's quite an experiment, should we say? And it's a, it, for me, it's a partial success. I would say, I wouldn't be as we get? cruel as uh, as some people about it. Uh, but I don't think it's his finest work by a long way. We I didn't get that many brands in this one, did we? We we got we didn't get that many brands in this one. Normally, plenty of his luxury brands around. Uh, we got Vespa. We got the soap. Wasn't there some American uh, yeah, soap? Exactly. I wasn't familiar with it. Girl and it was Camay soap, which you can Camay Girl which, and Maxwell House coffee. Get some Shirley's cigarette case. Get some Ange. He mentions the ink spots as well, doesn't he? And the oh, music. yes, there's a few musical references. I can't yeah. mention, not his car, but the higher car. What was it? A, uh, it wasn't a Mustang. It was a, um, what was the car? It's, uh, and there's Pussyfoot Liver Meal. What's what are in this? Thunderbird. I Thunderbird. can't remember. It was a Thunderbird, yeah. I can't afford a car, yeah. so I never know it's what they are. Yeah. Uh, so there was um, Omnibus not, for me. You know, it was not the branding as, as we know it, you know, in, in terms of... Well, the, the branding was tough to do in an Adirondack motel because, you know, it's not going to be... Not the highlights. Higher end things here. It's going to be budget, you know, isn't it? It's, it's going to be budget things in a motel. And we certainly have expensive hotels in the Adirondack, but that's not where the book was set. Yeah. So you've got your Camay soap and your Maxwell House coffee and... And that's, Frida, that's what's missing for me. When I read a Bond book, I want to be taken away to glamorous places yeah. that most of us are never going to visit, especially when he comes to the U.S. Yeah. He's very good at describing the U.S. with signs everywhere. And I didn't get that. I didn't get brands that I can't... I can afford Maxwell House, but other than that, I don't think I can afford any of the others you just I'm mentioned. Right. So that's what I want in a, yeah. in a Bond yeah. book. I tell Sorry, you what, David. Though. Go on, David. No, I, I was just saying that maybe Shane could afford Camay to soap. Uh, that, uh, that's a, was a big feature. No, you're right. I mean, it's not, it, it is not uh, set in in, uh, in a luxury world. And, and and not only was it not set in a luxury wor world, but something that Ian has Bond do all the time. Like every time he goes to a new place, he's like, oh, this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. This is beautiful. So beautiful. And Viv doesn't do as much of that and i think that's partially because ian didn't want her to sound like bond so where bond would have said oh well you know look at these purple mountains majesties and and look at the beautiful shimmering river and look at the beautiful shimmering lake and i sure do love the boats he can't have Nib talking exactly like bond so she's going around all cynical and even i will admit that that is a weakness in this book because if you are from england you've never been to the adirondack absolutely it could be described in a way that's absolutely as wonderful as Istanbul and that's something Ian did not choose to do it did not have them choose to do and I will say that's a weakness of the book 
I guess he was trying to have a different voice to his own because he's a middle-aged Englishman, public school yeah. educated, and she's a young Canadian girl. And I just think he probably wanted to have a different voice from his usual narration, which, you know, I agree. It, it doesn't make it as enjoyable to read, but it maybe that's more realistic. It makes you wonder why he didn't do this under a pseudonym and leave Bond out of it and, and, and create a more of a thriller with Viv herself mm. blazing away at these, these guys, you know, having a great combat sequence through the woods and, you know, you know, Viv herself becoming some degree of a, of a super Yeah, like a modesty blaze. Like. I think she could yeah, have. Yeah, that was it... the difference, well, that's though, a good right? name. With, with her. <laughs> But that was the big difference, right? It was like she's very, very different from pretty much every other Bond girl, you know? In that, yes, you're right. She was going to throw the knives and she had the, the ice pick at one point. But that's a story of what do you do when you're faced with death, right? Do you fight back? And you never really, unless David was in the commandos, right? He was with Lord Lovett, D-Day. But the rest of us had never been <laughs> confronted. We don't really know how we'd react. And that's the difference with other Bond girls. You know, if you think back to them, they, they could all, most of them could handle themselves. Yeah, you look at Pussy Galore or Tiffany Case, they were pretty tough, pretty tough yeah. girls. But I think Viv, in some ways, is even stronger because she's younger. You know, she comes from more innocent backgrounds, um, but she's still pretty tough and resourceful. Excellent. Well, thing, I think if there's one thing also, you, you were saying about the press just sort of backtracking a bit, panning it or some of the press, maybe they didn't like the fact that Ian shone a light on what goes on in the press world in the offices with young girls and, and editors taking liberties, you know, just like this fancy guy at the, uh, at the hotel, you know, she, she read him, she knew what he, where, you know, how his card was yeah. marked, you know? So, um... Yes, because yeah, he worked in the press. He knew that world, didn't he? So he was exactly, kind of using yeah. his own experience. Maybe they didn't like just, that. He shone a light I want on to plug in with, the, with a, a, a trivia thing that was just so marvelous. At, at one point, Millicent tells Jed, you can get those urges off on West Street. I'm a couple of minutes from West Street. And West Street really is a part of town where you can... Night town, yeah. Uh, meet a woman of, of, uh, of ill yeah. repute for the evening. And that's one of the things I love about the book because, like, I'm not going to tell you how I know this, but for Ian to know this, this does not go, go on any tourist maps. The only way you know this is if you've been here or have a friend who's in the market for that kind of person. So it's just marvelous to me that he got that detail right. And I, I wonder how I, I know I have been searching. Been asking all my friends, did have you seen this skinny Englishman? You know, and well, uh, it's often it Bond's on. priorities when he goes to a new city, isn't it? Booze, food, and professional and love. <laughs> so. Excellent. Well, I, I, you, you mentioned taking liberties there, and yeah, I think the only one taking liberties here is Ian Lancaster Fleming. I think he's taking liberties out of all of us that had handed out. I mean, we got these advanced copies, but people got out and spend their hard earned on this. I think he's taking liberty. So I hope, and I'm glad to hear he's writing another one, David, because I'll forgive him one clunker in 10. I don't think that's a bad rate at all. Um, but let's see what, I mean, if the next one is similar to this or he goes radical again, I think that's me out. I have to say that. That will be me this, out. This Bond in this book, he can't even shoot straight, not with a gun anyway. I hope so, M I mean, doesn't find out. He's going to so suck yeah, him. Marianne Russell saved him in... Yeah, you know, that's we were right only, so yes, yeah, yes, and, and Domino Domino saved him in uh, Thunderball. Thunderball, yeah, so yeah. He's... So, so let's not yeah. say that this, this is a new thing, he's often incompetent, but I am eager to see what he'll do in the next book to see, yeah, what he and decides what he he's got to change himself slightly. Well, this won't wash Excellent. on the silver screen, will it? This Scotsman they've got, he's, he's gonna have, he's gonna have to be made of stronger stuff than this character in the book, isn't he? Think, well, I'm I think just he's, a, he's, he's not at all right for Bond. I the thing is about Bond is that he's classy, and this Scotsman, I cannot believe him as an upper class person at all. I, he's just wrong. I think he's got. I've heard he's a bit of a brawler. He's a bit of a fighter. Well, I've yeah, heard he that, used yeah. to. He, believe it or not, 
he used to deliver milk to my auntie in Edinburgh. Well, I, can, I can completely so believe that. I can't take him seriously as James yeah, Bond. I can't take him seriously cover. as James just... Bond. I just don't think he's going to succeed. I, you know. down. But David, I'm amazed that you talked about this casting. I'm amazed that Ian Fleming's not playing Bond himself. <laughs> well, uh, I have got a ticket actually for the premiere of Doctor No in October. So next time we meet to review his new novel, I'll also have seen the movie. But excellent. I think that um, he will come back with something very, very strong. He's stung by this. He's stung by the criticism. And um, it's not what he was, uh, it's not. Understandably, he he's quite hurt by the whole thing. He's, he's, he tried to get it withdrawn, actually. But Kate yeah. uh, had, had already published uh, the first edition. He actually asked Kate not to publish it. And Kate said, too late, it's gone. Uh, and then there's an audience for it. Pardon? There is an audience for yes. it, isn't there? I mean, I enjoyed it. Well, even yeah, though, just not yeah, your average one reader. I don't like. I say, I, I think it's it, it, it's a partial failure, you know. But uh, it's a huge failure. I don't know where you're getting partial yeah. from. I mean, I don't even know if I'd go back and read. I don't even know if I'd go back and read the last third. What? You know, and dip into it as I'm like. Well, a, that's the worst bit. Think, yeah, it's the worst bit. You move, know, but. Done. Yeah, but I don't want to read all about Vivian either because I've got no interest well, in, in we, that. We all kind got of a genre, bit of a heads so... up. I mean, if we haven't got a heads up of what was, I mean, I got a copy from Miss Pike, you know, that's where I got my copy. She yeah. gave me her copy. But, um, you know, if if I hadn't have known what was in store, I would have probably been a lot more disappointed thinking, where is he, where is he? But, I, really? you know, I got the heads up of what was in store. So, uh, and honestly, say, well, I like Colin uh... McGuinness. So, there you go. <laughs> Let me wrap up with this, right, David? You said that Ian had written this because he was concerned that school children were seeing Bond as a hero. I don't even think, and I don't think they should, that uh, bookshop owners should sell this to school children. I think that they should be stuck out the back and not out for the public. To buy. I don't think no. school kids should be reading about this. What, this particular book or his books in general? No, this book. Oh, his other books, fine, but this one, I don't think school kids should be reading all about no, this. Into awful well, trouble. Why? I mean, that, that's why his, his explanation makes no sense at all. I mean, if this is a cautionary tale that's supposed to be read by <laughs> school children, I think it's a fairly turgid cautionary tale. Um, but um, you know, I, I I think it's all posthumous rationalisation, and uh, you know, it, 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 he he is. At the end of the day, one has to say, a brave artist. I mean, he's done a he lot is. of different things. With, I mean, we spoke earlier about the formula, but last time we met, we kind of agreed that there wasn't a formula. Uh, and in a certain way, th there isn't, because the structure of some of the books are quite different. It, Casino Royale was really a hard-boiled spy story. You know, it was really a noir, if you like. And then, you know, you have all of the colour with him bursting into action with uh, Live and Let Die, which is a very different sort of dynamic. And, you know, he's, he's, he's covered a lot of ground and most of it very successfully. Unfortunately, you know, this one uh, has hit the buffers in a certain way. Uh, but, uh, well... So as as we finish up, maybe we can go around everybody then, and I'll start with you, Andy. Uh, what's one reason that someone should give this book a go? It's as we said, it's modernism. It's uh, it's we, we're moving forward in this decade. Things are changing. Things are changing musically. Liberated young women. Um, Maybe that's it. If you're looking, if you're looking for a hardboard spy story, like David just said, maybe give it a miss. If you've got an open mind and you, you're you're on board with pro progress as we're moving, as things are opening up, give it give it a try, or just wait for the next one. If you if you're not that that open minded, that's what I would say. Yeah, if you're open minded, give it a punt. Um, maybe the audience is different. You know, as, as Frida said, maybe. It's it's an opening more for for young women to read something more empathetic. 
and uh, that's it. That's that's all I would say. That's my closing statement. So generally a thumbs down from me, but there we go. Okay. Hey, Ian, how about you? What's the one reason that someone should give The Spy Who Loved Me a go? I think a very simple reason is it's a very easy, quick read. It's this is his shortest novel, um, and and as Purdy said, it's very much of the moment. It's modern. It's showing the new age, the 60s. I mean, for me, it's a thumbs up. I enjoyed it. And how about you, Frida? Thumbs up. I love a book of, of adventure. I love the idea of James Bond as a human being and that ending where she just goes off on her Vespa. Yeah, love it. And final word to you, Mr. Craggs. One reason to read it, I think, is the first person female narrative. I think it's extremely well done. Uh, and I think that's a very difficult trip to pull off. And it's a further illustration of his prowess as a writer. And that aspect of it really works. So I think for that alone, it's worth reading. But as Andy pointed out, if you want a spy story, this isn't the one for you. Because it actually, it isn't a spy story. It's, uh, it's a coming-of-age story. It's a, uh, a gangster, part gangster thing if you like um you know but uh yes the first person narrative would be the reason that i would give to read it excellent and, and i would just add only completists should read this so if you've read the other nine then you should read it because you read the other nine but otherwise skip it go to the next one because uh there's too many good books out there uh you know if that coming of age genre is not for you then uh, as it's not for me and good luck to those of you who like that kind of thing you know knock yourself out but uh, i won't be returning to this one so uh, thank you all for for joining us today on the spybury podcast i'm actually amazed we've gone 56 minutes to talk about this one i thought we might be done after 15 uh all right. <laughs> and uh we look forward to uh talking about the next one so uh, we'll see you back at the james bond book club then very good